Julius Robert Oppenheimer would eventually be known as Robert Oppenheimer by history books. He was born on April 22nd in the year 1904 in New York City. However, he would eventually be known more as Robert Oppenheimer, or even J, as he is still referred to today. Oppenheimer, Robert. Robert was born to a well-established Jewish family in New York City. Just like his son's birth in May of 1871, Robert Oppenheimer's grandfather, Julius Oppenheimer, had already, 20 years earlier, been born in Hesse-Nassau province, which fell within the territory of the Kingdom of Prussia, what was to form the unified German Empire. At the age of 17, in the year 1888, Julius Oppenheimer set foot in the United States after leaving Germany, which was already witnessing the rise of political detest against the Jews in the western and central regions of Europe. Although he did not have any money at the beginning, he did well in the U.S. And by 1904, when Robert was born, he had already become wealthy enough to hold a senior management position in the textile business, dealing in the manufacture of fabrics in one of the leading textile factories based in Manhattan, New York. Ella Friedman, the mother of Robert, was also of Jewish origin. She was born in 1870 in New York to a family that had come to America about a generation earlier than Julius Oppenheimer from Germany. Some of her artistic views, which she held regarding the structure of the world and the order of things, Robert inherited from her as she was an artist. There was another son born to Ella and Julius. This was Frank, born in 1912, eight years after Robert, who had also become a physicist like his elder brother. Robert was brought up in a rich household with all its advantages. By the middle of the 1900s, his father had earned much respect among the business elite of New York, and in the early 1910s, the family moved into a big, two-bedroom apartment located on West 88th Street in Manhattan, just a few blocks from the Central Park Reservoir, one of the richest areas at that time. The walls of the household bore some interesting sculptures, among which were works by Pablo Picasso and Vincent van Gogh. Robert was a student at the Ethical Culture School and Alcuin Preparatory School, two of the best institutions in New York City early in the 20th century. Robert took an early interest in mineralogy as a hobby, encouraged by his German grandfather at the tender age of five. At the age of 11, an extraordinary ability earned him membership in the Mineralogical Club of New York City. He was born with a very bright mind, and this characteristic did not fade during his years at secondary school. He studied at Alcuin for one and a half years less than usual and skipped the first, second, and eighth grades, completing all the two-year grades within a year and a half. At this juncture, his attention had shifted from mining and due to his interest in the physical sciences, chemistry, and ultimately, physics proved to be his forte. In 1922, he was already 18 years old and was admitted to Harvard University, to the astonishment of many people. Initially, Robert was expected to concentrate in the area of chemistry, but that later shifted to physics because of so many things that captivated him and the prior chemistry background that he already possessed, which came in handy before it became common for every scientist to specialize in one field. Quite significantly, while still in that institution, the lessons of Professor Percy Bridgman, a Harvard experimental physicist at that time, did have some influence on him. Furthermore, the same period, which saw the continuation of the pursuit of many subjects by students at Harvard and American elite colleges, prompted Oppenheimer to read a considerable amount of history, as well as the Greek and Latin classics that were still staples of most curricula in the West in the 1920s. As he grew older, Oppenheimer would look back to his days at Harvard and say that he did a lot of reading and spent most of his time in the library. In reality, the number of classes he attended was more than what was required of him. Consequently, Oppenheimer was able to satisfy the requirements of his education at Harvard in the year 1925 in the period of only three years, and received a Bachelor of Arts degree with the highest honor, summa cum laude. Normally, this degree was conferred after four years. However, Oppenheimer, being a part of the modern trend, completed his studies even before that. Long before he completed his studies at Harvard University, Oppenheimer was already accepted to the University of Cambridge, England. In the last part of the 17th century, when Isaac Newton was a student there,
it was the best place for the study and advancement of physics in the UK. It has not only retained, but also enhanced its prominence. Oppenheimer spent a formative year at Cambridge in the autumn of 1925 and the summer of 1926, where he encountered the ideas of Lord Ernest Rutherford, a New Zealand-born scientist and essentially the man responsible for the science of nuclear physics today. As an illustration, the year 1908 saw Rutherford winning the Nobel Prize in chemistry for being the first individual to uncover the explanation of nuclear half-life and the associated emissions. So, at the end of the first year at Cambridge, Oppenheimer accepted an invitation extended by the German physicist Max Born to study at the University of Göttingen in Germany, which had already gained a reputation as one of the best learning centers in Europe. Oppenheimer's talents were beginning to attract a good deal of attention from physicists in Europe. Oppenheimer took courses with a number of his contemporaries, whom he considered to be more than peers, but colleagues who would become legends in the practice of theoretical physics in the 20th century. These included Werner Heisenberg, Enrico Fermi, and Edward Teller, some of whom he would work with during the Manhattan Project in World War II. On an impressive note, Oppenheimer obtained his Ph.D. in physics slightly over a year after relocating to Göttingen in the spring of 1927. Two years later, a winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics, the internal examiner James Frank is famous for confessing that he was glad when the fun was over, referring to the oral examination, otherwise known as VIVA, in which Oppenheimer had done such a good job in phoning in all requests that the examiner might have started to interview him instead. The co-authored paper by Oppenheimer and Born in 1927 titled Quantum Theory of Molecules introduced the principle now known as the Born-Oppenheimer approximation and was perhaps the best embodiment of the outstanding potential Oppenheimer exhibited as a theoretical physicist just as he was turning 23. This feature pertains to molecular dynamics, which is concerned with the motion and interaction of the molecules themselves. Since all nuclei are heavier than the orbiting electrons, it puts forward the non-adiabatic systems born Oppenheimers looking up spiral configuration. What this means is that the more energetically calculating wave function memory, which is of a lighter class, pertains more to the numbers of the electrons than to the numbers of the provided inertia of the more massive nuclei, which are comparatively inactive and hence quiet. The reasons for the approximation made by the two researchers were connected to Oppenheimer's interest in physics and chemistry, as the model they developed drew on both molecular physics and quantum chemistry. In practical terms, the approximation became helpful for scientists to avoid confusing the motion of an electron with that of the nucleus, starting from about the late 1920s. It was interesting who worked this out with Max Born and navigated his Ph.D. studies around Göttingen. Of course, Oppenheimer was neither a removed researcher nor an easygoing chap. In social situations, whether he was outside or at home, he remained mostly introverted and extroverted only occasionally. Being a chain smoker, he choked every passing adult day with smoke, which over time left him and ultimately caused him to die in his early 60s. Most people who knew him in Harvard, Cambridge, and Göttingen, however, described him as a gifted individual with an inconceivable mixture of intelligence and, at times, utter foolishness that led to very silly self-destructive behaviors, including an inclination to blow out of proportion any slight incident. With the passing of time, his condescension towards those who worked and studied in his presence, and later whom he trained, decreased the level of developing superciliousness. Equally impressive was his interest in Eastern philosophy and mysticism, while particularly fond of Hinduism and Confucianism. He even went as far as learning Sanskrit, the religious language of the Hindus, so that he could access the ancient texts of the people in their original form. Fascination with stargazing and esoteric ideologies was scarcely an unusual pastime. From the perspective of Oppenheimer's worldview, theoretical physics and other natural sciences were methods of understanding truths deeper than the material universe and the life in it. More so, that philosophical outlook accepted all kinds of knowledge without being restricted to proving anything. There is, however, the fact that Oppenheimer was often erratic and prone to outbursts. He was an eccentric student at Harvard, 
and instructors and peers occasionally raised concerns about his conduct. In what is likely an exaggeration, it is claimed that in 1926, before the French vacation, a Harvard undergraduate prepared a poisonous apple and delivered it to Patrick Blackett, a fellow Cambridge tutor with whom the student had an unstable relationship. It appears that, as a result of this and other occurrences, his academic status at the University of Cambridge was nearly rescinded. One such fascinating account comes from a talented playwright and the director of the theater, Francis Ferguson, who was a close associate of Oppenheimer during the 1920s, and recalls that upon sharing his marriage intentions, Oppenheimer attempted to physically attack and even choke him. All this chaotic behavior was explained by the duality of a man who could be extremely arrogant and consequently had conflicts with numerous associates throughout his life, yet whom most biographers agree was paradoxically a very fragile individual. The reason for this might have been the fact that Oppenheimer's father was a German immigrant to the United States at a time when anti-Semitism was rampant in the Western world. He is said to have suffered from bouts of depression on a regular basis and to have been in a perpetual state of alienation. In a word, he was rather cryptic. After finishing his degree in Göttingen, and after a few more papers resulting from research work done in England and Germany, Oppenheimer went back to the United States. He was a Howard Fellow and a Caltech Fellow for a short while, before bouncing back to Europe to spend some months at the University of Leiden. Most of the earlier and remarkable research of Albert Einstein was done in Zurich, Switzerland, as well as in the Netherlands. In Leiden, Oppenheimer earned the nickname of Oppie, which is a corruption of the Dutch version of his name. For several years, Oppenheimer was offered faculty jobs at various universities in America, but he would not come back and settle in America until 1929. He accepted two appointments as the Associate Professor of Physics at Caltech, California Institute of Technology, and the University of California, Berkeley, he would serve at both institutions for the next 13 years, except for July 1942. He would work at Berkeley in the fall and winter semesters before moving to Caltech, Pasadena, for spring term lectures. Oppenheimer was an outstanding teacher who would gain fast prominence in the American physics circle during the 1930s. The best American physicists of the mid-20th century studied under him at Berkeley and C-A-L-T-E-C-H, where he founded the School of Theoretical Physics. In general, a dozen or so graduate students and research fellows fully devoted themselves to working with Oppenheimer on a few of the most prominent theoretical physics problems of that time. During the more active weeks of the term, for instance, they would often see each other almost every day, and at such moments, Oppenheimer could ask how they were finding the work and offer advice. More than anything, he offered even more to those he was teaching as several of his biographers, who were acquainted with him during that time, noted, making them believe that they were standing on the front line, fighting against some of the greatest challenges that mankind faced then. In spite of being engaged in a broad spectrum of academic activities, Oppenheimer and his co-workers often indulged in Plato's works in Greek, as well as Sanskrit, when they were not dealing with physics. According to his friend Hans Bethe, who could testify from that time, Robert was cut off completely from space and time in California in the late 1920s and early 1930s, 1930s, because he was not even aware of any stock market plunges, particularly the Wall Street one, that occurred in late 1929, until several months after it actually happened. In the 1930s, Oppenheimer and his students at Berkeley and Caltech accomplished some impressive scientific progress. As in the year 1930, Oppenheimer was the first to plead for the existence of the positron, antimatter counterpart of the electron, which is common, and this was published in 1930, his paper in 1930. However, the student from Caltech, who was also working with Oppenheimer, Carl David Anderson, did not find concrete proof of the positron's existence until the year 1932. Then, Oppenheimer was helping Wendell Furry from the Oaths in recombining the theory of electron-positron and more recent developments of their interaction. At a time when the U.S. had very few women physicists, Melba Phillips, who was Oppenheimer's first graduate student, participated in a large-scale undertaking, which was perhaps the most important work of Oppenheimer.
In 1935, they co-invented the Oppenheimer-Phillips process, a nuclear reaction induced by deuterons, whereby the target nucleus fuses with the neutron component of the deuteron and emits a proton. This proved that deuterons could induce radioactivity in certain elements and that nuclear interactions could occur at energies lower than previously believed. Consequently, with these and many other advancements by Oppenheimer and his disciples at Caltech and Berkeley around the middle of the last century, California became one of the major centers of theoretical physics in the world. In the course of these events, Oppenheimer was also occupied with personal matters. After being diagnosed with a mild case of tuberculosis in the late 1920s, he underwent treatment for the disease in the dry winds of Arizona and New Mexico, even going to the extent of buying a ranch in the latter. In the midst of the 1930s, he began a romantic relationship with a young woman called Jean Tatlock, who was studying psychology. Jean was the daughter of the famous Old English expert John Strong Tatlock, who was also a specialist in the works and life of Geoffrey Chaucer. Jean, who had strong feelings of melancholy and unresolved sexual conflict, was ten years junior to Robert. Even after Oppenheimer took interest in Kitty Harrison, a Caltech scientist and plant specialist, who married Robert a day after she divorced her second husband, Stuart Harrison, in November 1940, the relationship with Jean was tempestuous until 1940. It remains uncertain whether Oppenheimer continued seeing Tatlock frequently in the wake of her suicide in January 1944, even in the early 40s. Robert and Kitty would later have two children, a daughter named Catherine after her mother, born in 1944, and a boy named Peter, born in May 1941, because Kitty was pregnant by the time of their marriage. World War II occurred in the autumn of 1939 and brought about an upheaval in Oppenheimer's life and that of nearly all of Europe, North Africa, North America, and most parts of Asia. Adolf Hitler's Nazi Party coming to power in Germany in early 1933 was the main causal factor for the conflict. The Nazis were nationalists and fascists who hated the Jews and had two main goals, to rid Germany of Jews and to deprive Western Europe of peace by instigating another war to prepare for the objectives of the Treaty of Versailles that concluded World War I, the new German Third Reich, which would control Europe. Oppenheimer was well familiar with the Nazis. He was a Jew, but did not practice any religion. In the mid-1930s, he began devoting 3% of his salary every month to help German Jews escape out of Germany because of the anti-Jewish Nuremberg Laws, which were enacted starting in 1934. Thus began his political career. The Germans had experienced internal anti-Semitism once more, starting in the year 1936, when World War II in Europe commenced and managed to capture the previously mentioned states, including east of Zelina, Slovakia, where in 1936-38 to 38, events were also related to emigration and anti-Jewish suppression increased dramatically. In the same vein, when German forces entered Poland at the beginning of September 1939, resulting in Britain and France declaring war on Germany, American sentiment regarding joining the war was still ambiguous since it was considered a European affair. Therefore, America would remain officially neutral for the first two years of the conflict, despite the fact that the administration of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was shipping military supplies to Britain from the very beginning of the war. Oppenheimer's existence and destiny would change with the events of December, year 1941. Keeping in consideration the situations prevailing in Europe at that time, given that Poland was already occupied by the Nazis during the fall of 1939, and Denmark and Norway were taken the following spring, followed by the Low Countries and France in the summer of 1940, the United States still chose to remain neutral in the Second World War. Adding to this, countries with Nazi allegiance like Italy, Hungary, and Romania were already present in the plan of waging war against the USSR and its colonies in Africa starting in the summer of 1941. Thus, it was quite clear that Germany was destined to conquer all of Europe. It is against this background that the ultranationalist Empire of Japan made the preemptive attack on Pearl Harbor against the United States, even before war was declared.
Much like in its heyday, by the early 1940s, the empire had already occupied large areas of the eastern sections of China, Korea, and Manchuria. On December 7, 1941, after the attacks on Pearl Harbor and other areas, including the Philippines, the United States of America officially became a belligerent in the Second World War on the Carp ship. Consequently, it was already war in the entire Northern Hemisphere where America was at the vanguard of the war against Germany, Italy, and other Axis nations. The war would push Oppenheimer to the center of U.S. research activities. At that time, Nazi Germany was attempting to develop an offensive capability, a weapon of mass destruction, in order to assure a speedy victory in the war. This was evident in that Germany, in the 1920s and 1930s, boasted some of the brightest scientists in the entire world, making it very easy for them to realize a nuclear bomb. In 1938, Lise Meitner and Otto Robert Frisch were among scientists in a group that successfully carried out nuclear fission in Berlin. The next year, the Nazis began conducting a number of experiments in order to exploit the discovery for the production of an atomic bomb. Some of these focused on the design of nuclear energy systems, while others also pursued the idea of producing atomic bombs using heavy water. This was the research done in Norway during the Second World War. In August 1939, Leo Szilard, a Hungarian nuclear scientist, and Albert Einstein warned President Roosevelt in writing about the threat posed by such activities by the Nazis. There was hardly any action taken in 1939 and 1940, and regarding this, but after the United States joined the war towards the end of 1941, ideas began to form regarding the United States carrying out such research. In 1942, the U.S. placed under its control the Manhattan Project, a scientific and industrial research effort aimed at developing a nuclear weapon. This project, in practice, controlled Los Alamos Laboratory, which was also overseen by Robert Oppenheimer during the Second World War. From the very name, one can only speculate that the core group of the more extensive mission was formed in 1942 on Manhattan Island in New York City, where they also set up their first base. To the last stage, it expanded to an estimated nearly 130,000 people in the country by 1942. They were also responsible for different aspects of the project in various states and even different locations. For example, a huge group comprising Elio Sillard, who was also a co-signer of the letter to President Roosevelt, warning him about the dangers of the Nazi atomic bomb project, and Enrico Fermi, a colleague of Oppenheimer at Göttingen, constructed the world's first working nuclear pump in Chicago during the war. In Tennessee, a related endeavor was in progress, and another team at the Hanford site, located in the state of Washington, had the job of transforming uranium into plutonium to be used as the core component in any nuclear weapons in the near future. Espionage activities were even conducted by teams of people across Europe to establish the extent of the Nazis' technological advancements, all in the name of the Manhattan Project. As the director of the Los Alamos Laboratory located in New Mexico, Oppenheimer would manage the most crucial research group out of all the teams working on the Manhattan Project. Oppenheimer came very close to losing out on this role. General Leslie Groves had overall responsibility for the Manhattan Project. Groves is not a household name nowadays, but he is notable for having been in charge of the construction of the United States military headquarters, the Pentagon, and the project that created the country's first atomic bomb. In 1942, Groves had his reservations concerning Oppenheimer's proposed appointment to the head of a group of nuclear scientists and theoreticians for the Manhattan Project. Groves was more comfortable with the idea of finding a recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physics who could command the respect required to lead such a brilliant group of individuals. Over time, people began to believe that Oppenheimer knew how to get the maximum out of all those with whom he worked. Groves contacted Oppenheimer, and after their conversation came to the conclusion that Oppenheimer was a good candidate for the job. In the months of early winter 1942, Oppenheimer made an attempt to locate where to put the research facility in the subsequent weeks. It had to be away from any population centers, 
isolated enough to ensure secrecy and allow for the testing of a bomb containing nuclear energy. He finally chose Los Alamos, New Mexico, and converted an old-fashioned school into a research facility. This worked as a War Department subcontract and allowed Oppenheimer certain liberties in whom to hire and whom to fire during his service as director of the Los Alamos Laboratory. Still, the number of those hired would far exceed the number of those dismissed. It was much more than 5,000 at peak operations, a number that Oppenheimer had clearly misestimated during his days at Los Alamos. Some of the most prominent scientists in the world were also included in the team put together by Oppenheimer at Los Alamos. One of them was John Hasbrook Van Vleck, who was already at Harvard when Oppenheimer came in 1922, a physicist and mathematician. He later would win a Nobel Prize in 1977 for his work on electronic magnetism. The design work for the bomb's gun, which was used to bomb Hiroshima, was likewise undertaken by Van Vleck. While the bombs used against Japan and in the test explosion were later dubbed Thin Man, Little Boy, and Fat Man by Robert Serber, the physicist from Berkeley, who was also the organizing physicist in Los Alamos, the names came as inspiration from detective novels and movies such as The Maltese Falcon. Hans Bethe was a German-born theoretical physicist and a recipient of the Nobel Prize in 1967. This was due to his 1964 developments through scientific investigations, in which he utilized his skills to help determine the critical mass of the bombs developed at Los Alamos. Lastly, Edward Teller was a Hungarian Jew who was enlisted to work at the Los Alamos Laboratory. He had been to Germany during the late 1920s, studying almost at the same time as Oppenheimer. However, he immigrated to the U.S. Before being sent to New Mexico, Teller was employed at Fermi's Reactor Corps in Chicago. At Los Alamos, Teller was perhaps the closest colleague to Oppenheimer. The research teams at Los Alamos, on the other hand, had hundreds of engineers, metallurgists, chemists, and military personnel who were occupied with various other details concerning the possible design and enhancement of the first atomic bomb. Being a scientist, an engineer, or a physicist often poses ultimate challenges that they must surmount without expectation of surrender. By the time the scientists came together at Los Alamos for their work, they had only the basics of understanding the mechanisms of a nuclear chain reaction. Positing the fact that we now live in a time when the site and aftermath of a nuclear explosion are not strange to us, it is very pertinent and imperative to note that Oppenheimer and his colleagues at Los Alamos were not only inventing a bomb, they were also designing its aftermath when one exploded. Hence, lots of experimental and theoretical hypotheses occurred in 1943 and 1944. Oppenheimer worked very hard during this period. He worked very efficiently, said Hans Bethe, years later. His remarkable speed in grasping the essential points of any subject was one of his great assets. He was able to master the details of every part of the project. He did not leave decision-making to the office, and although Oppenheimer was present physically and mentally at all crucial points, it took a toll on his health due to the intensity of the work schedule he was committed to at Los Alamos. He had always been lanky, but while in New Mexico, an additional 20 pounds dropped off, bringing his weight down to as low as 110 pounds, less than 8 stone. The Los Alamos Research Center developed a proposal denoted as Thin Man during the mid-1940s. At first, the weapon was not one for imploding like Chicago's bomb, but rather a gun, which would also be a more potent weapon than liquid explosives. This was difficult to accomplish from a logistical standpoint because the initiator was polonium, which had to be mined in Ontario, Canada, and then processed in a different state, Tennessee. It was either manufactured at the Hanford site in the state of Washington or included in the broader Manhattan Project. The design issue, on the other hand, was even more complicated. In order for the gun-type weapon to work, the plutonium bullet resting inside the bomb would have to reach a velocity of 3,000 feet per second, which is more than 3,200 kilometers per hour. If it didn't, a chain reaction and nuclear fission would occur before all the other parts of the bomb were ready to be exploded. Ultimately, this became the reason why the design of Thin Man was abandoned by the end of 1944. 
It was understood that the gun barrel needed to achieve this speed would be impractically enormous for a bomb small enough to be fit and transported within the newly designed heavy bombers, the B-29 Flying Superfortress, which was designed to deliver any of the nuclear bombs developed by the USA. This, combined with the misgivings surrounding the possible employment of plutonium in a gun-type handheld nuclear weapon, resulted in the termination of the Thin Man Plan in April of 1944. Following the shelving of the Thin Man concept, Oppenheimer reallocated a number of the scientists and engineers to work on the Little Boy design instead. Unlike the Thin Man, which utilized plutonium, Oppenheimer planned to employ uranium-235 instead of plutonium for the nuclear fission that would provide the explosion in this simplistic gun-type fission bomb. At the same time, there was also the natural progression of the third type of design. The device referred to as Fat Man was also an implosion design, except this time it would use plutonium. This design was spearheaded by an American physicist known as Seth Nettermeyer. Oppenheimer kept faith with the gun-type design throughout 1943 and 1944, notwithstanding attempts to push Fat Man forward. In 1943, Oppenheimer proved he was a cut above the rest during his stint at Los Alamos when he invited Hungarian mathematician and physicist John von Neumann to the site to evaluate the design. Von Neumann, who advocated for the use of smaller amounts of plutonium arranged in spherical shapes, proposed ways to make an implosion-type bomb. For many months, Los Alamos metallurgists tried to make a round sphere of plutonium, and finally, they succeeded by inventing a plutonium alloy with gallium, forming the balls, and nickel plating them. The completion of the design stage seemed to become a reality. As the year 1945 dawned at Los Alamos, the teams under Oppenheimer had almost finished the final details of the Little Boy and Fat Man constructs, respectively. Thus, there were two possible designs for an efficient nuclear explosive up for consideration. The resolution of design complications in the spring of 1945, along with the production of required amounts of enriched uranium and plutonium at the facilities located in Tennessee and Washington State, would eventually result in the completion of both designs around the same period. Considering the technological level of the Manhattan Project, tremendous engineering work had to be carried out, especially since it was quite costly and time-consuming to enrich those materials to fissile grade. Engineering issues accounted for the majority of the remaining problems. For instance, in 1944, during the development of the Fat Man bomb, there were initially over 1,500 bolts designed for the device a number which was impossible to scale down into a practical weapon. Oppenheimer's group completed this task in the summer of 1945, reducing the number of bolts to just 90. In 1944 and 1945, Oppenheimer's team analyzed a bomb similar to Fat Man and Little Boy to see how it behaved during freefall. Other structural issues included the bomb's freefall from a certain height, Everything fell into place in the spring of 1945, and by midsummer, Oppenheimer was able to tell Major General Leslie Groves, the commander of the Manhattan Project, that preparations for a test explosion were complete. The nuclear test, codenamed Trinity, took place in the desert of Jornada del Muerto in New Mexico on July 16, 1945. The translation of the Spanish name for the desert happens to mean the root of dead man. In a 1962 letter to Groves, Oppenheimer revisited how he coined the name Trinity for the test, confessing that he had been reading sacred texts by the 17th century poet John Donne. The test was to drop the Fat Man bomb, which was a device made with plutonium in the form of implosion. The explosive was mockingly referred to as the gadget, as a joke. It was also decided that the testing would be conducted in an area far from populated regions and hardly accessible. The MCDONALDRANCHOUSE was the sole building within the designated area where the explosion was to occur. A German settler had built it in 1913, and the MacDonald family left it behind in 1942 when the government took control of the region during the Manhattan Project. The test was thoroughly organized because, back then, 
there were agonizing ways of enriching uranium and plutonium, which would have cost millions of dollars just to produce the intended plutonium ingot. The results were of great importance. Oppenheimer later wrote in his diary that he did not want, or was even ready, to explain to a congressional committee why he irresponsibly blew up billions of dollars worth of plutonium in the middle of the desert. The time for the Trinity test was scheduled for the early hours of July 16th. For monitoring purposes, three different observation shelters were selected, one built to the north, the second to the south, and the last to the west of the point of explosion, each about nine kilometers away from the center of the bomb parameters. They believed that this radiation distance was enough to enable the creation of a radioactive half-life and provided goggles to block harmful ultraviolet rays. Among the several scientific observers that morning were Oppenheimer, Teller, Bethe, Fermi, and John von Neumann, among others. Some people believed that the device would not go off. Others were concerned with the actual scale of possible destruction. When the device detonated at 5.29 a.m., releasing as much power as 25,000 tons of TNT, all these questions were answered. The sand at the test site melted, forming a crater one-third of a kilometer wide, which cooled into translucent green volcanic glass. The onlookers, positioned nine kilometers from the explosion, observed a growing fireball whose colors changed from purple to green to orange-white. It took them 40 seconds to hear the extremely loud sound associated with the shock wave. During that time, the cloud developed and formed the mushroom-shaped cloud, which climbed to about 12 kilometers. Moreover, the catastrophic event created destructive waves felt as far as 100 kilometers away. People in the observation structures, nine kilometers away, remembered feeling a sudden intense heat, like an open oven, just before the bomb went off. In more recent times, Oppenheimer's remarks, said to have been made when he witnessed the Trinity explosion, have become quite popular. It is said that he cited a verse from a very important book among Hindu scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita, which was written towards the end of the first millennium B.C. Its meaning is approximately translated as the Divine Song. The 700-verse Gita is primarily about the Prince Arjuna, and his discourses on several aspects of religion and morality with his teacher, the god Krishna. Many people erroneously believe that when Oppenheimer paraphrased the god Vishnu from the Gita, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, he inaccurately translated the text. While it is true that Oppenheimer could not have uttered such a statement on that morning in New Mexico, it would have been a statement apt for the occasion. Oppenheimer, reflecting back on the episode two decades later, said that there was another line from the Gita, that, the glory of the present, is as powerful as a thousand suns blazing together in the sky, that kept visiting his mind. Of course, Oppenheimer did not use the words, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, but rather thought this other line more fitting in hindsight in the year 1965. Observation shelters for the success of the Manhattan Project were opened and filled with people who were rather somber. Reports later confirmed that Oppenheimer was incredibly happy. In just a couple of weeks, however, the ramifications of their victory would come into clear view. The atomic bomb was to be employed against enemy combatants less than two months after the Trinity detonation. By this point, the conflict in Europe had already been brought to a close. In early 1945, the Allies began their offensive into Germany from both the East and West, causing Hitler to take his own life in Berlin at the end of April, and the German armed forces to capitulate less than ten days afterward. Nonetheless, the Imperial forces of Japan had given no indication of surrender, and their military ethos, along with codes of honor, hinted at the necessity of invading the home islands if the war in the Pacific was to be brought to an end. According to U.S. government estimates, however, if the Japanese were to fight to the last, it would mean the death of millions. Consequently, the administration was keen to resort to the use of the new atomic bomb as early as possible in order to effectively communicate with the Japanese the kind of weapon they were dealing with. This was the government headed by President Harry Truman, who took over leadership in the White House after President Roosevelt died in mid-April of 1945. Hence, 
on the 6th of August, 1945, the city of Hiroshima, located in Japan, became the first victim of a little boy bomb. That day, somewhat paradoxically, Oppenheimer had an air of confidence and seemed to express regret that the device had not been used against the Germans. Three days later, however, and not long after such hopes had been expressed, a fat man-type bomb was dropped over the city of Nagasaki, leaving only despair in its wake. Oppenheimer and his colleagues reached the conclusion that this must not be permitted. In the end, because of the time zone difference, the Japanese were prevented from contemplating the ramifications of the first bomb, and their surrender came only six days after the bombing of Nagasaki, bringing the hostilities to an end. In the context of warfare and geopolitics, nuclear arms have only been put to actual use twice in the course of all known history. The use of nuclear weapons in warfare, therefore, is a controversial concept. Most modern historians who wrote about events occurring in August 1945 hold views similar to that of Oppenheimer and his associates, who believed that the primary aim of bombing Hiroshima was to bring a quicker end to the war with Japan, and also more importantly to prevent the invasion of the islands, which would have taken away millions of lives. The majority consider, however, that the bombing of Nagasaki, which occurred in a few days after the first bombing, was superfluous. There are also ethical considerations about the actions of Oppenheimer, his colleagues, and other individuals involved in the Manhattan Project. The two elements can be accounted for. At this point in history, it is almost redundant to say that the advancement of nuclear arms has greatly complicated the survival of mankind as a whole, but at least it has been effective in restraining rivalry between major powers and leading states since they have not engaged in all-out war since 1945. Historically, the states of Europe had constantly gone to war with each other. Everything changed with the understanding that the very act of warfare virtually guaranteed mutual annihilation. The advancement of nuclear weapons has managed, to some extent, to promote a so-called nuclear peace. However, in the present-day world, where politics are becoming increasingly bitter and turbulent, such peace carries its own significant risks. In retrospect, Oppenheimer gained unprecedented eminence in American intellectual circles after the completion of World War II. In 1947, he resigned from his position at Berkeley and moved to Princeton, New Jersey to work as the executive director of the Institute of Advanced Studies, one of the leading centers for physics in the country, which had or had visiting physicists such as Paul Dirac, Niels Bohr, and even Albert Einstein. This move was made for growth opportunities that became available to him. Under Oppenheimer's leadership, the Institute evolved into a center for young physicists, and when he left Berkeley, six of his most brilliant graduate students followed him to Princeton. At Princeton, Oppenheimer did little in the way of writing and publishing for himself, but he brought the approaches that he had established in California in the 1930s and instead stimulated a noisy and inquisitive culture in New Jersey, often to the detriment of his own research. Consequently, during the last years of the 1940s and the early 1950s, the Institute became the center of physics research in the country. Most of the leading 20th century physicists, including Murray Gelman, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1969 for elementary particle physics, and Yoichiro Nambu, a Japanese-American who shared the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2008 for his work on spontaneous broken symmetry, studied at the Institute while Oppenheimer was its director. Apart from Princeton, Oppenheimer also took up several official positions in government in the late 1940s and early 1950s. He was also privy to classified papers regarding the U.S. nuclear program due to his security clearance. Of interest in this regard is his appointment to the new Atomic Energy Commission, which was overseen by the United Nations, with mandates pertaining to maintaining peace in the world after the war. The responsibility of the Energy Commission was to ensure that the proliferation of nuclear material, along with weaponry, did not advance. For several years, following the conclusion of World War II in 1945, the USA was the only state in the world with nuclear weapons. But it was only a matter of time before other states developed their own bombs, or at least attempted to, as soon as it became known that it was possible. In 1946 to 1947, Oppenheimer, 
together with several colleagues from the former Manhattan Project, helped set many of the limits on nuclear proliferation that remain in place even today. As the Cold War began to take shape, Oppenheimer, who was the first chair of the commission, endeavored to broker peace in the nuclear arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union. His efforts, however, were futile, and the nuclear age began in full force the very next year because the USSR successfully tested an atomic bomb in 1949, which led to a fuming nuclear arms race that began. Once it became evident that the Soviet Union had successfully detonated a nuclear bomb in 1949, the administration under President Harry Truman started to think the unthinkable and presented the need for a hydrogen or thermonuclear weapon. It is important to admit that the atomic weapons of 1945, which were an offshoot of the Manhattan Project and deployed against Japan, were nowhere near this weapon that is being considered. The concept was not well received by Oppenheimer and many other scientists who had been at Los Alamos between 1942 and 1945. They maintained that this type of weapon could not be deployed without inflicting enormous damage and running the risk of nuclear escalation that would eradicate most of the planet's species. In their appeal to the authorities at the end of 1949, they maintained that the appealing features of this scale of weapon systems for any purpose, military or otherwise, do not come close to the envisaged damage to civilization itself. However, Truman remained resolute and gave his backing to the introduction of the new program in January 1950. In November 1952, almost three years later, the first ever hydrogen bomb exploded on a nuclear test site in the Pacific. The so-called Ivy Mike device had an explosive force of nearly 10 million tons of TNT and was 450 times stronger than the bomb dropped on Nagasaki, Japan, by the U.S. in 1945. Many, including Oppenheimer, had their reservations, but the Cold War was about to turn into a nuclear standoff. While Oppenheimer had been one of the driving forces behind the Manhattan Project and a high-ranking scientist within the government for a long time, in the early 1950s, during the Second Red Scare, he did not see eye-to-eye -eye with the government. The period saw the partitioning of Germany into a socialist East Germany and a West-friendly West Germany. The formal organization of the Warsaw Pact and North Atlantic Treaty Organization as counter-military blocs. These events aggravated the already existing tension with the Soviet Union. The Korean War also brought the clash between the West and the East. America, in this regard, had other concerns as well, worrying that communist organizations would act as a fifth column for the Soviet Union. However, these fears turned into active and unreasonable paranoia towards anyone with a suspected socialist agenda, including groups such as the American Civil Liberties Union. The Second Red Scare designates a phase in the history of the United States which occurred after the end of the Second World War and was concerned with finding and eliminating communists wherever they might be hiding, with the apex of this period being around the years 1950 and 1954. In the age, one wouldn't be surprised if every aspect of their past was examined to determine the probability of their association with communism, and Oppenheimer, like numerous others, fell victim to the frenzy that was the second Red Scare. After a childhood where his activities were hardly political, Oppenheimer would take an interest in the politics around him soon after. The mid-1930s gave him vast contacts with socialists, leftist politics, and civil rights movements in America. Therefore, it was not surprising that he participated in many activist and radical causes during that time, as socialist organizations and parties were seen as the only reasonable answer to combat the encroaching fascism in Europe. This particularly started in 1936, when Stalin and other communists in the USA sought support for the Republicans' cause during the Spanish Civil War against the monarchs. Even though many of his friends were committed members, Oppenheimer was never a member of the Communist Party USA. Included in this situation were his spouse Kitty, his sibling Frank, and Jean Tatlock, who became the romantic partner of Oppenheimer back in the year 1936. In the course of the 1930s and 1940s, Oppenheimer also took part in other leftist organizations, for instance the American Civil Liberties Union and many others.
But we also recognize those movements now as the very civil rights movements that helped desegregate the country over a century later. With the United States being drawn into World War II, there were increased worries regarding Oppenheimer since his father was born in Germany. It implied that he could have been suspected of working for the Nazi regime in Berlin. Still, Oppenheimer was a man about whom a lot of doubts existed. In that peculiar moment when he was among the highest ranks of the Manhattan Project personnel and the FBI had an active file on him, he was even under surveillance during the war. These matters came to a head in 1949, which forced Oppenheimer to appear and give evidence to the House Un-American Activities Committee concerning his political beliefs. He admitted that he had connections with the Communist Party during this period and said that many of his prominent students at Berkeley, who were active in the 1930s, were also part members, but he maintained that he had never been a member. At this time, the interrogation did not provide any additional information. However, in a period of four years, specifically in the early winter of 1953, the FBI made the mistake of suspecting that Oppenheimer worked for the Soviet Union while in the U.S., which caused a fresh round of accusations. This was all part of the red paranoia that filled America after the second Red Scare. In mid-December 1953, U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara announced the suspension of Oppenheimer's security clearance and recommended his resignation from all official positions. Oppenheimer did not agree to this and called for a private hearing, which was held in the summer of 1954. Oppenheimer worked with Edward Teller, who stated that he had been less than appreciative of Oppenheimer's tenure as laboratory director at the Los Alamos Laboratory on various occasions, speaking against Oppenheimer. This disloyalty was blamed for the lifting of Oppenheimer's security clearance in the mid-1950s and his withdrawal from public and political life. For several years, Oppenheimer suffered after the security hearing and the revocation of his clearance. The academic world was divided over the issue. Oppenheimer had the support of most of his colleagues, but the highest education authorities in charge of American colleges were often less positive. Some of them even canceled Oppenheimer's lectures and other appearances. Oppenheimer's low self-esteem made him explain his refusal to take part in several campaigns spearheaded by leading figures like Einstein, who sought to mobilize the government and the American people against the dangers of nuclear weapons proliferation, even when this activism was clearly called for. Instead, he moved to the insular Caribbean territory, known as the Virgin Islands, and soon began spending longer periods of time outside of the continental United States. On the island of St. John, he acquired the property on what used to be known as Gibney Beach, now referred to as Oppenheimer Beach, for all intents and purposes. From 1957 on, he spent the majority of his time in India, despite the fact that numerous American universities and other institutions wanted him to come give guest lectures. Given the long gap from his last research work, the 1950s were very lean for him in terms of publications, since hardly anything was written. By toward the end of the 1950s, there were concerted efforts to bring Oppenheimer back from exile. In recognition of his efforts during World War II on behalf of the Allies, the French government awarded him the Legion d'Honor in 1957. In 1962, he was elected a foreign member of the British Royal Society. By that time, the people of the United States had started to understand that the persecution of individuals who were only loosely involved with the American Communist Party, without any relations to the USSR during the Second Red Scare, was seriously overreaching. To that end, in 1963, President John F. Kennedy made moves to vindicate Oppenheimer's name and conferred upon him the Enrico Fermi Award. The award was created by the U.S. Department of Energy in 1956 and was named after one of the first nuclear reactor designers, Italian-American Fermi, who had died of stomach cancer in 1954. Fermi was a molecular biologist who lived out his days in Chicago until he eventually succumbed to the disease. Among those who had helped Oppenheimer at the Los Alamos lab from 1943 to 1945, the award was presented to several individuals, notably von Neumann, 
Betha, and Teller in the years 1956, 1961, and 1962. However, Oppenheimer did not give up on his sense of victimhood for too long. He was receiving the award in 1963, which recognized the Red Scare regime's misjudgment in targeting him. There wasn't much time for Oppenheimer to enjoy the small victory of rehabilitating his image. His habitual smoking would soon ensure a diagnosis of throat cancer, two years after he was awarded the Fermi Prize in late 1965. Back then, many types of cancer, which are well treated today, were almost a death sentence. After undergoing aggressive chemotherapy for the purpose of prolonging his life, Oppenheimer slipped into a coma at the onset of 1967 and died on February 18th at his residence in Princeton. He was 62. Even though the Enrico Fermi Award he had received in 1963 could do little to restore his good standing, and many politicians were still turning a cold shoulder to him, the academic elite paid their last respects to Oppenheimer at a formal funeral attended by over 600 members of academic and research institutions, the military, and other fields. Oppenheimer had a military background, and many of them worked in Los Alamos together with Oppenheimer. Days later, his ashes were scattered in the sea around St. John's Island in the Caribbean. Time, it seems, has healed all wounds. In marked contrast, many members of the United States scientific establishment who disapproved of Edward Teller, the physicist who spoke out against Oppenheimer during his secret hearing in 1954, remained hostile toward him for many years. In 1967, Oppenheimer was given a third posthumous nomination for the Nobel Prize in Physics. Oppenheimer had been nominated for the Nobel Prize in Physics two times previously, in 1946 and 1951. However, he lost the prize on both occasions. Oppenheimer's numerous other achievements notwithstanding, the absence of the Nobel Prize in his list of awards has provoked many arguments over the years. Nonetheless, the reasons for him not winning the prize seem to be straightforward. To begin with, individuals such as Albert Einstein, who authored several books and published over 300 journal articles in his lifetime, were prolific authors, which Oppenheimer was not. In contrast, Oppenheimer published only five journal articles in the post-war period. In addition, although he worked across a variety of sub-disciplines within physics and made many enduring contributions, he did not furnish enough of a theoretical or empirical advance in any one area of study as to make him a contender for the Nobel Prize. Usually, a specific accomplishment gains one the Nobel Prize and not a body of work spanning several decades. For instance, it is mostly owing to his investigation of the photoelectric effect that Einstein was awarded his Nobel Prize. Hence, it was concluded that Oppenheimer's accomplishments were not of the nature that warranted a Nobel Prize, although there were opinions that his studies of gravitational collapse had such a strong potential. In the last turn of events, he was most effective when integrated into teams, leading groups of scientists and physicists. That is why he was the most qualified person to head the Los Alamos Laboratory during the war. Robert Oppenheimer is regarded as one of the best theoretical physicists of all time. The period between the 1920s and 1960s is marked with significant advancement in knowledge concerning the cosmos as a result of his studies and research. In particular, he was involved in clarifying the year 1927, where the concepts of molecular dynamics changed due to the advent of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, and how, in 1935, the process of nuclear reaction induction by deuterium, addressed by striking by deuteron, was first introduced by Oppenheimer and Melba Phillips. Yet the most enduring of Oppenheimer's accomplishments will remain his contribution as the director of the Los Alamos Laboratory for the Manhattan Project. Simply put, during the latter phases of World War II, Oppenheimer is arguably the leading American scientist responsible for the atomic bomb. There were still serious concerns about the consequences of such ideologies being put into practice, yet for some reason this was regarded as a valid line of research in Oppenheimer's case. In fact, Oppenheimer devoted a considerable part of the post-war years to preventing the development of weapons of mass destruction that would be even more deadly than their predecessors.
thus conveying the deep anguish he felt over the dreadful force that he and his peers had unleashed on the world. In his early fifties, the state which he served turned against him, silencing him, and in that manner exiling him during the Second Red Scare. His heritage, though, still has power. He was an exceptional individual, with a more than metaphysical attitude toward the matter, and so he is rightfully referred to as one of the most outstanding physicists of our time. What are your thoughts about Robert Oppenheimer? Did his central role in the Manhattan Project merit a Nobel Prize? Many thanks for watching, and as always, please share your views in the comments section below.